Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Colin Campbell. He's a writer and a theater and film director. He's the author of the book, Finding the Words, Working Through Profound Loss and Hope and Purpose. Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. So we'll get into your book in a little bit, but first off, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Yeah, yeah. So my family was on a trip to Joshua Tree. It's a it's a desert. It's a town in the high desert, about two and a half hours east of Los Angeles. My wife Gail, and then my fourteen year old son Hart, and my seventeen year old daughter Ruby. And we were struck by a drunk and high driver going ninety miles an hour in a fifty mile an hour speed zone, and both Ruby and Hart were killed. And my wife and I were plunged into unimaginable grief and. And out of that experience, I started to really learn what it, what it means to, to mourn. I was really taught by the Jewish traditions. My wife's Jewish, we raised our kids as Jews, but I'm not Jewish, but I really embraced some of the Jewish traditions and they, they taught me a lot of valuable lessons about grieving. All right, well, first off, so sorry for your loss. And oh, thank you. You mentioned that this incident taught you how to grieve. So mm. what, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I really, I, I like to say that my, my upbringing was grief averse. My, my family's culture, we don't really grieve or don't really delve into grief, you know? And, and so I, I had ideas about grieving. I thought that grieving meant that you go away in your own little corner and you just feel sad until you somehow miraculously feel better and come back to join the community. And in fact, I learned that, that it is so valuable to not grieve alone, that if you can grieve in community, that if you can find people there to journey with you in any, any capacity, it's so helpful. So of course, after the incident, you said there weren't, wasn't a lot of guidance. So mm. tell us what happened next. Tell us how you decided to go on this path and not grieve alone. Yeah. Well, so our, our, our loving rabbi, Sharon Browse and, and the head of our synagogue, Melissa Balaban came right to our house right afterwards. So early that next morning, there they were holding our hands and guiding us through this process, this terrible, terrible process. We had to go to the mortuary. We had to pick out caskets. We had to pick out, you know, burial plots. These are all these things that we had never mm -hmm. even thought that we might have to do for our own children. Right. Uh, and, and then the Jewish tradition has a lot of guidelines, a lot of support structures for for the early grief process. So you sit Shiva, people come to your house every night for the first seven nights after the funeral. And that's when I really started to learn about grieving in community because my initial instinct was no, don't come to my house. My God, I, I, I'm in no shape to have people come and be in my space. And yet when they did arrive, I found that it was so valuable to suddenly share my pain and grief and also stories about Ruby and Hart to my circle of friends and family and my community. And they too had a need. They needed to share stories about Ruby and Hart. They needed to grieve. We all needed to grieve together. And that was a very powerful lesson in the idea that, that we grieve as a community when someone, when someone dies. You decided to share this tragic story in, in a book, finding the words, mm -hmm. working through profound loss with hope and purpose. Why do you decide to share the story in a book? Yeah. Well, thanks for asking. My wife and I, Gail and I, we went to many grief groups, sat in many grief circles and heard many stories. And a lot of the stories involved the idea that we were going to lose all of our, or most of our friends and family, they were going to fade away in our grief and we were going to be abandoned. And there was so much bitterness and loss in these people's voices. When they talked about this, it was really obviously a, a, a horrible secondary loss after they lost their loved one to be abandoned, to feel abandoned. And I, and I really felt like there was a, a cultural miscommunication happening because I knew my friends and family didn't want to abandon me, but they also were scared about upsetting me. They didn't know what to say. Nobody knows what to say because we don't talk about grief and grieving in the public sphere. Most often people are shown, you know, going away in their corner, like I said. And so my wife and I developed maybe because we're, we're from theater backgrounds, we're writers, I don't know. We had a facility with language, but, but we found a way to talk to our friends and family, to tell them our needs. And it was so helpful. And so I really wanted to share that, that idea of the tools one could use to keep your community close. So talk about some of these tools. What are some specific ways that one can 
keep their community close after profound loss. Yeah. Well, my wife and I, we developed what we call our grief spiel, which was we would pull people aside. What happened was people would come to our house and they would look stricken. They didn't know what to say. They didn't even want to say hi or how are you because they were scared they were going to upset me. And they didn't want to say Ruby and Hart's names because, again, they thought that would trigger me potentially. Not all of our friends, but, but many of our friends felt that way. And I could relate because I would have felt the same way. I would have been terrified to mention somebody's dead children's names, right? And so we felt we had a need to tell them what the ground rules were. So we'd pull them aside one at a time and say, here's the spiel. <laughs> you know, we need to talk about Ruby and Hart. We need to hear their names. We want to hear their stories. We want to talk about our grief. And, and if we can talk about other subjects, it's only for a couple of minutes. We're going to circle back to our grief because we can't chit chat right here. Mm -hmm. And our grief spiel changed over time. Our needs changed over time. And our friends really responded. They were, they were very grateful to that. They ran with it. So, uh, so that was one wonderful tool. And then another tool was the idea of rituals, the idea of holding public rituals, sometimes small gatherings, sometimes large gatherings, but giving all of us a space to do something in honor of Ruby and Hart and our, and our shared grief. Even if it's simple as just, you know, spelling their names out in, in rocks on the beach or taking a walk and talking about them or writing letters to them as a group. So there, there were a number of rituals we did that really helped keep our community close. So tell us how these rituals, how did that specifically help you and the community? Yeah, well, I'll do the, my first birthday ritual with the, with the rocks. So, so my 50th birthday was September 13th, only, I don't know, two and a half months after the car crash. And here I am celebrating my birthday. And I, I was not in the mood to celebrate anything. I felt like my life was destroyed. It was gone. My, my past life now became just nothing but the painful thoughts of how it all ended poorly. And my future seemed bleak and meaningless. But every year before that, I would love my birthday parties and I'd invite Ruby and Hart's friends and my friends to the beach. And so I thought, instead of pulling away and having a miserable day of just agony, how about I invite people to the beach for a memorial for Ruby and Hart? Not for my birthday, but for them. Mm -hmm. And a huge crowd of supporters came and we all spelled out their names in rocks. We told some Ruby and Hart stories and we all jumped in the ocean in their honor. And that helped me, that helped me get through what could have been such a bleak day. It, it, it was a painful day, the pain didn't go away, but it allowed me to be in community and grieving and moving through that day. And it became a special, beautiful day. Talk about some of your interactions with the healthcare system, whether it's doctors, social workers, specialists, counselors, what was your interaction mm -hmm. with the healthcare system during the, during this time? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for everyone who helped us in every step of the way, but the, my initial interaction with the healthcare system, it, it, in retrospect, it did seem like there was a tiptoeing around us that people didn't want to tell us the truth about Ruby and Hart. On some level, I, I knew my wife and I both knew that both Hart and Ruby were dead in the back seat, but he came and they heroically conducted CPR on both children. And then they rushed them to a very distant hospital. We were in the desert, so a distant hospital. And then they, they flew Hart to a, a further hospital, a, a, a PICU unit, a pediatric intensive care unit. But they didn't want to tell us how bleak the situation was. Nobody really wanted to tell us that, in fact, Ruby was already dead by the time we got to the hospital. And they didn't want us to see Ruby's body. And one of the one of the moments that really stuck with me that was such a tragic lost opportunity was <clears throat> right after the crash, my wife has very poor eyesight and her glasses were, were thrown in the car crash. Mm -hmm. So, so are mine, but my eyesight is a little better. And the paramedics and bystanders thought that she might've broken her neck, my wife. So they wanted to keep her stable. So they put a neck brace on her and they, and they kept her on a park bench about 30 feet from both Ruby and Hart bodies while they were having CPR conducted on them. And I was able to go to Ruby and hold her hand, but my wife wasn't. And she couldn't even see their children because they were just too far away for her eyesight in, at night, especially. And, and I think there was a, there was even somebody who said, you know, moms don't watch. They, they, they kept Gail away from the sight of her children. And she has deep regrets about that. She didn't get to hold their hands 
in, in that moment on the street. And I think that that fear, that the attempt to protect parents from the truth, from the awful truth, it doesn't help. There's no, there's no way to lessen the blow, right? Your children are dead. You can't soften it. And any attempt to soften is just going to obfuscate. It's going to make it seem like confusing. What's happening? Why aren't people talking to us? What's going on? And then finally, we arrived at the, at the PICU unit and this wonderful doctor, Janeth Ejike, Dr. Janeth Ejike, she pulled us aside and she told us the truth, that, that Ruby was dead, that, that Hart had died of, or was dying of three life-ending injuries. And then she did a very beautiful thing in that moment of terror and anguish. She said, tell me about Ruby and Hart. Mm. And it was such an extraordinary gesture because she wasn't backing away from our, our pain. She wasn't frightened of our agony, right? She was almost inviting more, right? <laughs> and we wept, but we told her about Ruby and Hart. And it was such an extraordinary moment of connection for us. It was such a deeply valuable moment and a, and a lesson for me in particular about the, the power of words and the power of taking action. So up until that moment, we felt helpless. We felt like we were just being buffeted by anguish and, and, and the unknown. And then here's someone giving us something to do. Hmm. Tell, tell me about Ruby and Hart. And she wanted to share our pain in that moment. And it was so, so beautiful and so valuable. And then, and then beyond that, the further experiences were with, were therapists, which were invaluable. Mm -hmm. So both my wife and I see our own therapists. I started seeing somebody after the crash. My wife already had a therapist before the crash. So she continued with that, with that doctor. And then we also saw Ruby's OCD doctor, OCD therapist. He saw us as like a couple, a couple's therapy for the first few months. And that was also very helpful. Now you mentioned the actions of the initial healthcare staff. So just for those clinicians who may be listening to this story and God forbid, if they encounter a similar situation, share some advice in terms of what you would have liked to see done. Yeah, I would have, I would have loved to, to be told the truth, uh, as hard as it was, as soon, as soon as they knew what was going on. Any specific um, way in, in that, that, that one would prefer being told the truth? Yeah, that's a great, tone, a great question. Well, well, definitely with compassion, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, not being afraid of the pain. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real takeaway for me in general, for all people dealing with grief, uh, the grievers themselves or people are, who love people who are in grief is to not fear the pain because the pain is going to be there. There's no way around it. You love somebody and they're dead. You're going to feel pain. It's, it's a pain is coming from love. And even though it's scary, it's, it's bearable. We can bear it. And, and there's no way to sugarcoat it. There's no way to soften the blow other than with compassion, other than with be, being willing to sit with that person. And uh, I think that's, that's the main thought that I would like to impart. Yeah. So after sharing your story and writing the book, tell us some of the responses that you and your wife have received. Oh, uh, wow. Well, even before I wrote the book, just, just telling the spiel to my friends and family, the responses we got were, were so beautiful. People would tell us stories about Ruby and Hart and many of them were stories that we didn't know. It was such a boon to us. It was so like, oh my God, thank God we've asked for help. Thank God we asked these people for their stories because now we're hearing things about our children that we would never have known if we had kept to ourselves, right? If we had said like, don't talk to us. <laughs> or if we had not reached out to our friends and actually actively asked them for stories. And then I, I've just, from the book, I've received such beautiful responses from other people in grief, mm. you know, who said like, I, I feel seen, I feel seen and heard because it was written very early in grief, my book. I started writing it just about, I don't know, I think six months after the crash. And so, so I don't sugarcoat it, the pain. I don't sugarcoat the grief journey. And, and again, the tools that the practical tools that I provide, I think were also helpful to people. The idea of taking specific actions in grief are lessons that I learned that I hope can help others. Yeah. So how are you and your wife? How are you guys doing today? Yeah. Thanks for asking. Well, she's in, she's in Los Angeles right now and I'm in New York. I'm performing a, a solo show about grief mm -hmm. called grief, a one man shit show. And I'm closing this weekend. I've been here for a month in New York. So I've got to get back to Los Angeles <laughs> and in terms of our grief, you know, we talk about it almost every day, I guess every day, and we're trying to live with it, right? We're trying to not compartmentalize it. We're trying to, 
feel Ruby and Hart's presence and their memories and our love that we shared and the pain of that loss. And then also we're, we're moving through life. We're trying to grieve with life. So we're doing things. She's remaining very active and creative and she's just got hired to work on a, a new television show. She's going to direct an episode and write an episode. She just wrote a kid, a wonderful kid's book, a book for middle grade called the big dreams of small creatures. It's lovely and light and hilarious inspired and i wrote a, a a darker book but hopefully also a helpful book so you wrote a book and you're doing a show centered about grief so what led you to doing a one-man show yeah i think again it was it was that need first of all i wrote i wrote the show first so i wrote the show in the very beginnings of grief just mm -hmm. after a few weeks after the car crash i began writing because i had a need to express myself because I think that's how all of us process anything. You know, even the good things, we process things by writing about it, by talking about it, by sharing it with loved ones. And grief somehow has become this taboo subject where you don't share the grief. You share everything else, you know. You share all the happy things and all the, the difficult struggles, but grief, people don't want to talk about. But actually, that's how we process all these things. So I needed to process what was happening to me because it seemed so incomprehensible. And then I felt the need to share that with other people. And then when I started sharing it, I got such affirmation from other people who are struggling with all sorts of different kinds of grief, not mm -hmm. just child loss, but people who lost siblings, people who lost spouses or loved ones or close friends, parents. And, uh, and I, I felt suddenly like, oh, almost like a missionary zeal to let's talk, let's be more public about grief. Let's have grief be more publicly discussed thing, because then it will be less scary, less lonely. We're talking to Colin Campbell. He's a writer and theater and film director. He's the author of the book, Finding the Words, Working Through Profound Loss with Hope and Purpose. There you go. <laughs> <My book. laughs> Colin, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin and the audience. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think uh, grieving in community is, is a big lesson. Find a way to grieve in community. And if you, if you don't have any community, find a grief circle, find a grief group, go out there and find community that's going to be there for you. And the other big lesson I'd like to share is don't be afraid of the pain. Mm -hmm. I think it's so scary. Grief is such a scary thing. You feel like you're losing your mind and you feel like if you, if you allow yourself to feel the pain, you will literally go insane and never come back to reality. It will be literally unbearable, but in fact, it's not true. We can bear the pain and we, we don't lose our minds. We come back. Grief comes in waves and, um, and allowing ourselves to feel that pain allows us to then come back to life more present and able to touch the joy that we shared. Colin, thank you so much for sharing your story, time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.